Hello, I'm here with uh, Teresa Ghilarducci, who is the head of the Department of Economics at the New School in New York City. Teresa, thanks for joining me today. Hello. Um, full disclosure, we're friends. I've known Teresa for a long time, been a big fan of your work. Um, you have written a lot on public pensions, uh, which is why you're mm -hmm. up in t Toronto uh, to, to, to speak at the conference. Um, yeah. The, uh, the so-called crisis in public pension funding. Is this a real crisis or is this a manufactured crisis? Um, well, you know, at one moment in time for some pension plans, it looks like a real budget crisis mm -hmm. um, in that the states have to put in more money to keep the funding um, somewhat healthy. But that always is in the case when, in the past, the states ha haven't put any money into the pension fund. So it's a crisis of um, short-sightedness, but it hasn't put any states under, and it hasn't threatened the bond ratings of any states. What is a real crisis is that a lot of the population of these states are going to be very poor um, elderly uh, elders. And that's going to cause some real long-term problems for the state budgets. So that's the crisis. The retirement crisis is the crisis. It's not a, a momentary budget problem for these states. Is it a retirement crisis, or is it a is it a crisis that could be solved by action by the federal government, for example? The federal government, after all, is the ultimately the yeah. sovereign of the uh, of the currency and. Uh, uh, we, we keep talking about social security crises uh, every every 20 or 30 years, um, and then we seem to quote unquote fix the problem. Right. And then it goes on for, uh, and, and now we're talking about it again, even though the social yeah. security surplus looks like it's going to last for another 50 years, for example. Yeah, right. So, um, um, crisis is an overused word, and especially in terms of, of something that needs more money from an entity that has lots of money. Climate change is a real crisis. Mm -hmm. um, um, the fact that we are headed for a 15%, 20% of the population to be downwardly mobile is a real, real problem. Um, and both of those issues, climate change and also the retirement shortfall, are problems that if we mitigate it now, it will cost a lot less than if we wait um, to solve the problem. So let me just go back to the uh, retirement crisis or the um, forecast that we are facing a, lo a lot of people won't have yep. enough money. It's a lot easier than the health care crisis because it's only a matter of money. We know that there is a large percentage of the population who are earning money now who are going to earn it later. This is a common problem, a simple problem, sort of a baby problem for an economist. Mm -hmm. That we want a smooth consumption over people's lifetime. It doesn't take very much brain power to smooth the population's um, consumption over their life cycle. And what we need now is to actually put more money or a claim um, for entitlement to more money in the future. And you can do it by putting actual pieces of paper that are claims to income to private assets called stocks, called bonds, called other kinds of financial instruments. And we could put that away in a fund and say, okay, this population, this person can have a claim to income when in the future. But it does take some forestalling of consumption now, and it takes a efficient financial vehicle for people to do that. Or we could have the federal government say, we're going to give you a piece of paper called a promise, a social security credit, and then you could have a claim to that um, in the future the assets from which that will be drawn will be future taxpayers. To an economist, it really doesn't matter if it's a claim to a private financial asset or a claim to a, a public asset. To an economist, it, it may not matter. I'll, I'll, it is, I'll, as you suggest, uh, ultimately a political choice. The question is yeah. really um, um, the the costs and charges and yeah. the churning of the, that you get when uh, right. these things become privatized. Um, yeah. suggests that maybe you want to have it as a, as a, as a government or a public option. Yeah, but there, um, some things can be insured by a private insurer. If there's a known risk and the entity insuring um, can have a backstop so that when the catastrophe or the contingent claim happens, that entity can pay the claim. But when we're talking about social insurance, when you have a whole population who's getting older and will face the contingent claim of being too old to work, for whatever reason themselves or because of the market, then you do need a government entity because the backstop is, is the taxpayers. So right now we have a mixed system and I'm talking about North America mm -hmm. and mostly I'm talking about the United States but Canada and 
Other countries, Anglo, Anglo American countries, have the same kind of system. It's a mixed system where you have private entities or, or even smaller entities like states and cities backing up their employees' claim to income within the future. Um, and you have a national systems where the claim is really on future taxpayers. If you actually assess the liability and count the people who are old right now, you can, you can predict how much they're going to need in the future. The liability in every way you measure it is not overwhelming. We can easily provide for people's retirement security if we had arrangements where everyone saved about 17% of their income and um, to get a claim of income in the future. And do you think that should become explicit government policy? I mean, should you we know, have mandatory retirement well, savings accounts? Well, let's look to see what we've done. Yeah. We had this system where we had a mandatory, half of it was mandatory, called in the United States Social Security. Um, employees and employers are um, statutorily assessed is 6.2% each, so that's 12.4. Mm -hmm. um, we know as economists that most of that payment is paid by the worker because the, the employer passes on to the worker, but it's 12% of pay. That's mandatory, the federal government does it. And it's highly regressive because, it's, as you say, it's a flat tax. Yeah, it's highly regressive on, on the revenue side, mm -hmm. but it's actually quite a progressive system because when you add the earned income tax credit mm -hmm. and you also um, cap the benefits of higher income people, mm -hmm. it becomes proportional to progressive because mm -hmm. embedded in it mm -hmm. is um, a longevity insurance. So you get the money for the rest of your life and you can claim it early and you have survivor's benefits and you have a disability benefits. Add all that together with an earned income tax credit and it's fairly proportional. But I think what you're, I know because we are friends <laughs> and I know where you're going, it is only taxing payroll or labor. Mm -hmm. It is, we haven't yet um, devised a way to actually tax capital yep. um, to, to pay for retirement. But that's coming. It's always been baked in the system. The founders in 1935 um, had predicted that by 1962, a third of the income would come from taxing capital or from general um, tax revenues. So the system, our social security system, um, does allow in some way for capital flows yep. to go in. But what I propose is that that social security system is social insurance, kind of a, it's a one size fits all plan with a little bit of disability and longevity and survivor insurance sort of on the edges. But on the top of that is this experiment with a highly financialized voluntary system of mm -hmm. voluntary employer plans. Now that system is crumbling, and that system is highly subsidized, it's highly inefficient. A lot of the money that we should be putting in the retirement bucket, you know, for future income is going, is leaking out in fees, in inefficient portfolio management. And it's often being raided, uh, the, the pension it's, funds themselves are being raided by the, uh, the corporations. So. Yeah, but mainly it's being raided by the financial managers. Yeah. It yeah. really is just cronyism in a not so highly regulated system of barely high And that's part of the problem in the, in the, the state pension fund crisis as well. You're, yeah. you're seeing a lot of instances of that. I, I think it's uh, New Jersey, where your resident is one of them, for example. Yeah. Um, sorry, Governor Christie. But um, there, there is some talk about um, uh, how pension funds have been yeah. successfully raided. Uh, and, and now there's right. this talk that, um, you know, that, that they're underfunded, you know. Um, yeah, no, so you see Illinois, um, you saw another Christie, Christy Todd Whitman, yeah. who was a Republican governor back in the, in the early 90s and late 80s. Um, she rated it, but yeah. in a way that was really comfortable for politicians at the moment. They just didn't put any money in for a while. And... That's Any the so-called actual, moderate like, Republican yeah, solution. It's, yeah. it's called, it's such a wonder, <laughs> the English language is so lovely, it was called a pension holiday, yeah. <laughs> a funding holiday. And not only did the governor take a holiday and the legislature had a little bit of mm -hmm. political comfort from not having to tax their taxpayers, but the taxpayers took a holiday. You know, but in all, every state, the workers um, actually kept their contributions up. So the employer, in this case it was the state, they took a holiday. But this can be solved with 
a lot of what I call in my paper for this conference, and thank you for making me write that paper, <laughs> um, good pension fund funding hygiene. So there are hygienic rules, rules of hygiene, mm -hmm. that can be easily imposed upon an employer. Fund steadily um, a promise you're going to pay in the future. So I really do the easy side of, of economics, which is if we're going to give money to people when they're old, this is a big political economy mm. question, we're going to let them retire, rich, middle class, poor workers can all retire, and this is the human part of your conference, yep. Yep. we're human after all, we all need some time after a lifetime of work to rest, to recom re you know, recompose ourselves. Um, other authors have called it to compose a narrative of what your life was about. And actually, I feel very passionate about this. And we had a system um, before this, this generation where everybody, even if they started work at 17, or some of us with all our, our advanced degrees at 27, mm -hmm. we could at least actually retire at a time when we would all live out kind of a normal lifespan and at least have the same number of years of and, and felt that it was worthwhile to provide a decent yeah. amount of re retirement income for uh, for people yeah. that had uh, spent their lives serving the, 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 the country in one form or another. Yeah, no, sure. one form or another. And what I like to call, and I've been talking to people who've come to this conference and they get it, mm -hmm. which is that we um, give a depletion allowance when we take natural resources from the ground. In our tax code is an explicit recognition that capital depreciates. And we actually allow that depreciation we have to make explicit that we depreci depreciate human capital or human beings by work. And that payment for depreciation is called a pension, and everybody should get one. I want to shift gears a minute. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, we, uh, I, I wanted to talk about um, uh, Medicare. Yeah. Because you've written some very interesting stuff about that. I remember uh, uh, being at a conference with you a few years ago, Jamie Galbraith. Uh, yeah. uh, in fact, uh, he very kindly said that he stole the idea from you, the, the proposal yeah. that he's popularized to uh, shift uh, Medicare, con yeah. well, well the, the age of Medicare down to from 65 yeah. to 55. And I think you were the first one to propose that, right. much to the horror of the Wall Street Journal, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I've horrified a lot of the industry. <laughs> um, I was called the most dangerous woman in America. Well, you are, clearly. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, mainly to people with deep pockets. Um, but here, here's the vision. If you lower the Medicare age from 65 to 60, um, you're bringing in a lot of people, a lot of people who really run out of the ability to work, or what the Europeans called um, workability. Mm -hmm. And for a lots of uh, people, we may not know as professors or as policymakers, um, these are people who start work um, because they don't go to college, and they are in jobs that require bending and stooping, heavy lifting intense concentration, keen eyesight, those kinds of jobs, um, and they really wear out, or they, are employ or they wear out their welcome to the labor market. Mm -hmm. So if you actually can grab them at 60 and put them into the most uh, efficient Medicare system, then you actually are it is, in fact, the Helping most efficient the health insurance system, actually, yeah, yeah, right. by, by, by far. I mean, the administrative costs of Medicare uh, uh, relative to, say, yeah. a, a private health insurance company is, is, is enormous. Um, the, and, of course... By um, factor of 10. Uh, absolutely. And, and of yeah. course, the other argument is that that's, that's where you could get your, uh, your real um, um, private health care, uh, the, the, the so-called public yeah. option. Randy Ray and I wrote a piece about this in a, yeah, a number right. of years ago and, and, and just right. suggested that that's really what you want to do. You want to expand Medicare because... Uh, in, right. and, 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 and ensure that um, you bring healthier people into the pool and thereby reduce the cost of Medicare. Because at, at the moment, we have the most infirm, the elderly, uh, in, 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 in the in, system right, right now. So, of course, it's the most expensive. It is, it is getting worse since you and Randy wrote your paper yeah. um, because of Medicare Advantage plans. Obamacare is helping a little bit because we're actually bringing in people from, um, well, from employer-based systems to an exchange system. but. We didn't get single payer or a public option. No, and and and, and uh, the the argument always is, well, we didn't get a, a, a public option, but we got ninety five percent of what yeah. we wanted. But we we took single payer off the, the the table, which is you know I understand it okay. may have been politically impossible, but but the public option was supposed we, to be the the so called yeah. compromise, and instead we ended up with negotiating that out of the yeah. final deal, and we've effectively entrenched private health insurance in, as, as uh, the, the core of our healthcare system. Yeah, and they'll always have the healthier ones because mm. they're the younger ones. Yeah. but if we 
lower the Medicare agents to go back to this idea, then you're, you're actually making that pool, and it's going to be bigger, um, filled with more diverse um, people in a system where not only is the administrative cost cheaper, but they're really doing cool things because they're collecting big data, and they really are uh, putting a lens towards um, towards the medical delivery. This is the technology of medical delivery in a way that private sector plans can't do because they don't have any incentive to invest in their members because they're attached to the employer and the employer sheds their workers all the time. But Medicare, knowing you're going to get them at 60, mm -hmm. are going to invest in their diabetes care um, or in other ways that actually help them take their drugs. And if you can do that early, you have a much healthier 80-year-old population. Plus the fact that uh, you, you, you exert real uh, discipline on the, the, the cost element from, the, right. from private uh, health insurance, uh, cost inflation, right. if you have that uh, introduced. It, the, the Medicare system is the only way you can, what, what we call, um, bend the cost curve. The way they do it to actually look at, look at the, the providers and the technology of delivering health care they can actually change the technology, uh, which it means actually investing in wellness, that private insurers don't have any incentive or really the data or the capacity to do it. So um, I'm liking this idea again, <laughs> <laughs> um, to lower the Medicare um, age, especially since we got Obamacare, the private exchanges, and didn't get single payer. And it would be a way of, as you say, uh, if, if people wanted to leave the, the, the workforce and get more young people into the workforce, yeah. they wouldn't feel compelled to do it because there's still so much of yeah. health care is, is attached to uh, in, yeah. our employment and, uh, and, right. and it's right. not portable. So Right, right. And so you actually have people working for their health care, not really for their wages. And, um, and therefore you have people who have find that their physical and mental limitations affect their, their ability to work because the rate of depreciation is really speeding up. And now I don't, you, you're not, younger workers and older workers aren't directly competing for each other in all markets, but in my industry they certainly are. We're cranking out the PhDs, but we're not retiring gracefully in order for them to take our assistant professor jobs. So there are lots, there could be a hit, there could be an opening up of space um, for younger workers if older workers would retire. Do you see any uh, indication that any of these proposals that you've uh, talked about today have yeah. been, uh, are, are yeah. they being embraced by the government or? I'm, I'm telling you, uh, Marshall, this, this year something has happened. And it's a um, combination of voters telling every pollster that their retirement income security, and they mean also the cost of health care when they get older, mm -hmm. is on top of mind of likely voters, not of all people, but people who vote, and those are older people, retirement and health security is the topmost issue. So politicians are beginning to listen. And also politicians like Elizabeth Warren mm -hmm. have come to, um, to Washington. She wants to maybe be like Kennedy mm -hmm. um, and really do bold things for working class people as she's taken on retirement issues, and she's gathered up with the leadership of, of Senator Harkin to actually put some proposals to expand Social Security, and we have not seen that since the 1970s. No, that's right. The whole tenure seems to be shifted, actually, you know, expanding and increasing it. Because, of course, what's wrong with having yeah. a, a, a good source of aggregate demand from older people that might actually have a real retirement income? You know, you know what? That turns out to be a real strategy of big cities. Yeah. Um, and if Detroit didn't have their old people, they'd be a lot worse off. Yeah. And say, tell that to Miami as well. So. Being old and sick is the future of our economy. <laughs> but, you know, it's a good way to spend money. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on that positive note, uh, at least we want to be old, uh, maybe not so sick, but uh, a little bit wealthier. So yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> I will leave it to that. Teresa, thanks a lot for uh, coming to share your thoughts with us. It's been great to talk to you as always. Thanks for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. Mm.